My name is Connor Nolan. I'm a senior software engineer at Akamai, and I'm joined by my colleague Rehard. He's going to speak a little bit later. Hello, everyone. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, Provider Ceph, which is an open source cross plane provider that we've been developing over the last year or so. Uh, and we use it to manage uh, S3 buckets in Ceph clusters from Kubernetes. Uh, so I'll go through a little bit of the agenda, kind of what we have in store today. Um, I'm going to give a bit of background, kind of how we ended up here, uh, the challenge that we faced, and um, then how we over overcame that, some of the specific requirements, and how that led us to uh, Crossplane. A little bit about Crossplane, I won't go into too much detail on it, um, but kind of how it works for us and how it's a, kind of the perfect solution for us. Um, so then I'll get into provider stuff itself, give a little bit of an overview, um, some of the features, how it works, that kind of thing. Then Reherd is going to take over, give us a demo, and uh, get into a kind of a discussion then on uh, scalability and performance, that kind of thing. Then we'll wrap up with a QA and a uh, and head for the airport. Okay, so uh, like I said, a little bit of background. Reherd and I both uh, previously worked at a company called Ondat, which was a London-based uh, Kubernetes startup. Uh, it was originally called Storage OS, later rebranded as Ondash. You might recognize the logos from previous KubeCons. Um, but as, well, what, what we did there was we offered a Kubernetes native uh, block storage solution. And as part of delivering that, we uh, maintained a bunch of different Kubernetes peripherals. So we had a kubestl plugin, a bunch of Helm charts, obviously a CSI driver. And then we had probably half a dozen or so Kubernetes operators, uh, all of which were like queue builder based. Um, so we would be kind of intimately familiar with that whole branch of the Kubernetes ecosystem, the operator pattern, all that, and that kind of, uh, I suppose, informed our decision making going forward on this. Um, so then about a year ago, I think it was actually about a year ago this week, I'm not sure of the exact dates, but we were acquired by Akamai. And then that led us to uh, a new challenge, which kind of combined our history and knowledge of uh, Kubernetes and storage. So the specifics of that challenge were, uh, we need to be able to manage uh, S3 buckets across multiple distributed Ceph clusters, and we need to be able to do that from within a single Kubernetes cluster. So basically we're gonna have Kubernetes as a control plane, and then external to that, uh, multiple distributed Ceph clusters. Uh, we want to have each bucket represented as a custom resource, so that would be the designated source of truth uh, for that bucket. And then we will attempt to um, reconcile the desired state off of that. Uh, the solution would need to fit into an event-driven architecture with an eventually consistent model. So you can kind of see where this is going already. It ties in nicely with the idea of having a custom resource representing that bucket and then trying to reconcile that desired state with the, the real world. Um, we also need to be able to handle these S3 operations asynchronously because we're dealing with multiple backends, obviously for performance needs. We need to be able to send off these S3 uh, operations asynchronously, and we need to be able to do it with a degree of visibility into what's happening on each Ceph cluster, uh, where buckets are being created successfully, if there's failures, what's happening, why it's happening, when it's happening. Um, and then the final thing was, uh, we're gonna have a lot of traffic. We're probably gonna to need to be able to handle upwards of 100,000 buckets. That also means being able to handle upwards of 100,000 CRs. Reherd's gonna talk through scalability a little bit later. Um, so based on like all of these specific requirements, you can kind of see where I'm going with this. The obvious solution that you would jump into would be some kind of a Kubernetes operator, a uh, controller, uh, but before we kind of Jumps, jumped headfirst into writing it. We decided to do a little bit of research, a bit of investigation to see was there something, some kind of solution out there that we hadn't used before that might make our lives a little bit easier as developers. And that's where we came across, across uh, Crossplane. So what is Crossplane? Uh, I'm not gonna get into a big discussion on Crossplane because I don't have time. Um, but this quote, which I found on an article in the news stack, uh, there about a week ago by Jared Watts, who's a co-creator of Crossplane, kind of sums it up nicely. So Crossplane is an extension to Kubernetes. It teaches Kubernetes all about external resources. And that's kind of the key there. It kind of sums it up both from a, like a general perspective um, and also from our specific use case. Like from a general point of view, if you're a 
cloud provider, you would develop a cross-plane provider to make Kubernetes aware of your cloud resources. From our perspective, we wrote a, a cross-plane provider, provider Ceph, to make Kubernetes aware of our Ceph clusters and their resources. Um, so if you really want to press me on what's cross-plane, for me, I look at cross-plane, if anyone asks me, uh, anyone who's familiar with KubeBuilder and Kubernetes operators, uh, KubeBuilder is to a Kubernetes operator what Crossplane is to a Crossplane provider. So Crossplane is kind of like the framework or the utility for building or scaffolding out your Crossplane provider and you insert your custom logic from there. So then obviously the next question is, well, what's a provider? So a provider is basically just another Kubernetes controller. I mean, if you peek under the hood and you drill down far enough into the code, you will come across a, like a conventional operator reconcile loop. Um, but you're kind of given out of the box a really clean abstraction on top of that reconcile loop, and that allows you then to kind of easily develop um, controllers that are used for managing external resources. Um, then there's obviously a bunch of other utilities and functionality you get with Crossplane. Um, for that specific use case, I won't go into too much detail on that. That's kind of just a drive-by on Crossplane itself. Um, so then why would we use Crossplane for this use case? Well basically for all the reasons I just said. Um, so Crossplane is kind of built on top of the whole operator pattern. Um, it's an extension of that. So for us, even though we weren't familiar with Crossplane, we were intimately familiar with operators and the operator pattern. So the learning curve wasn't a steep one. It, was, it wasn't a, a difficult jump for us to make and we were able to upskill on it pretty quickly. Uh, the second thing, so if you're developing a Kubernetes operator that reconciles your desired state in a custom resource with some external system or external API, you can you find that it can get really complicated really, really quickly. And from my experience anyway, I find that it's probably because if you generate a cube builder operator, uh, you're given a single reconcile function, reconcile loop, where you need to insert all of your custom logic. So it needs to handle all of the CRUD operations on a custom resource then off of that you need to handle whatever external API calls you need to make. All of that needs to be done item potently, and so it can get really complicated really quickly. Um, obviously you can structure your code in such a way that you don't have to do it that way, but what Crossplane does is it kind of gives you, like I said, that layer of abstraction and a kind of a, a separation, a logical separation of functionality for you to then insert your business logic on top of. So it gives you a cleaner starting point and uh, it just reduces code complexity and reduces software engineering overhead. Um, so then the last thing, so I've down here, um, transparency of managed resources through conditions. So can I, conditions is like one of these extra utilities or pieces of functionality that Crossplane gives you to help you write a controller for this type of use case. Um, and conditions, Specifically, we lean on heavily with provider stuff, so they give you kind of visibility into your resources. Um, they're both machine readable and human readable. So, uh, like I said, we lean on them really heavily, and uh, that's just kind of one utility that we use. Uh, so, how do we do that? So, this would be kind of a really familiar output to well, anyone who has developed in Kubernetes, but specifically anybody who uh, knows Crossplane. That's just a kubectl get output of a bucket resource, a test bucket, and you'll see there the things to notice there. You can see the age is 10 seconds old, but the uh, ready and synced, these are crossplane conditions that you get from crossplane. So what we found is these conditions kind of match really conveniently with the semantics that we had in mind for our bucket resource. Uh, so I'll explain what I mean by that. So what this looks like in real life, this is like a visual representation of that bucket. You can see there's a bucket, it's called an MR here, a managed resource, which is basically Crossplane speak for a custom resource, or two are kind of interchangeable. Someone from Crossplane will probably correct me on that, but for now you can just look at the bucket managed resource was created by a user. Um, provider stuff then attempts to reconcile that. It does so by creating a single uh, S3 bucket on each of our Ceph clusters. And you can see from the diagram, it was successful on one of those and it failed on two. Uh, but for us, what that means in terms of condition is the book managed resource is considered ready once it's, once it's created on any backend. Um, so you might say, well, why, why is that? Because 
obviously it's failed into. The reason is, if you're a user, you only need one instance of that bucket. You don't need it with 10 other replicas. So as far as provider staff is concerned, the bucket is ready to use by the user, but it's not synced. So what this means is provider staff can continue to reconcile in the background and attempt to overcome whatever transient errors are happening to stop it from being created on those remaining Ceph clusters. Uh, so the same bucket again, you can see the age. Now it's 40 seconds old and the two conditions. Now it's both ready and it's synced. And you can see what that looks like in real life. Whatever errors were being encountered by provider Ceph have been overcome and the bucket is now created on all three Ceph clusters. And what that means is that it's synced because it's been created on all backends. Uh, I should mention this slide is slightly out of date. We added a feature recently, minimum replicas. So you no longer need to have the bucket created on all backends for it to be synced. You just need to have it reach the minimum replicas quota. So I also mentioned at the start that we needed visibility into uh, our backends because of the asynchronous operations. So what we looked at there was the conditions of the overall bucket managed resource, which represents a bucket in itself, but we need visibility into each specific replica on each um, Ceph cluster. Um, so we, we expanded on the idea of conditions by kind of extending the bucket status with these, what are called here, individualized conditions. So you can see uh, up the top there, hopefully you can read it under each status, there's a list of backends, and those backends are the Ceph clusters that that bucket was supposed to be created on. So for Ceph cluster A, uh, the condition is ready, it was created successfully. For Ceph cluster B, the same. And then for Ceph cluster C, um, some kind of error has been encountered. And because of those conditions, we can see the last transition time. The message gives us the, um, the relative S3 error that we got from the Ceph cluster. And uh, so that's, that's it on a more granular, granular level. And then down below, you can see the actual conditions of the bucket resource itself. Those are what we just looked at previously. And obviously, it's ready, but it's not synced because it's failed on one backend. So this is useful, uh, obviously, for platform engineers to come along and be able to see, OK, well, the bucket failed here. When it failed, why it failed, et cetera. Uh, we also use um, health or conditions to monitor the health of our backends. So, Again, if you're familiar with Crossplane, you'll be familiar with the idea of a provider config. Uh, so in provider Ceph's world, a Ceph, each Ceph cluster is represented by a provider config object. And uh, within provider Ceph then itself, we have a additional controller reconcile loop, which does periodic health checks on each Ceph cluster, and then updates the, uh, the relative provider config statuses with the health check condition. Uh, so that's an example there of a, a failure, again, it's, it's got the same machine-readable format in terms of its condition, even though it's a, it's a customized one as opposed to what you get specifically out of the box from Crossplane. This is our own health check um, condition. And again, you can see last transition time and the reason it failed. So again, this is useful, A, for a platform engineer to come along and see why is a cluster unhealthy, and B, for a provider Ceph itself, because now it knows not to schedule any more buckets to this, whole, this cluster while it's unhealthy. Uh, so that's it for me. I will hand over to Richard. So I would like to speak a few words about the power of this architecture, that exactly Kubernetes gives us everything we need out of the box. Uh, we just deploy the application and uh, enjoy the result. Uh, Crossplane gives us the possibility to manage external resources out, out of the Kubernetes cluster which we exactly need. And the CNCF landscape helps us solving other difficulties which uh, we have during operational logging and everything uh, that this landscape is always uh, growing. So we have options to select our tools. But one of my main favorite points is uh, we have full control of what and when to reconcile. So we are able to reconcile individual buckets and actively monitoring them with the uh, crossplane. And also, we are able to uh, reconcile set of buckets based on built-in or custom labels. And also, we are able to reconcile the buckets based on the health check events, which we uh, pouring during the periodic uh, health check. And uh, <clears throat> exactly, you can build your own business logic based on cloud native events. So if you, have, if you would like to do anything with buckets, you just uh, watch the the, <clears throat> sorry, the buckets on the Kubernetes API server, and you can react with any kind of uh, event. 
but it's easy to speak about it. <laughs> so let's do the, the demo. So. First of all, we have uh, three identical providers. For simplicity, I'm using uh, local stack for this uh, demo. But as you can see, we have three of them. And the uh, health check is active. It is on. And the interval is two seconds. So I can apply this on the cluster. I have created uh, all the providers. And we have a, a bucket here. It is a simple bucket that we need some uh, validation and the auto pause function is, is true. I would speak about this uh, a bit uh, later. And then I can apply this bucket. So let's see what's happened on the cluster. I have a command to watch periodically the labels of this bucket. Exactly, the labels are, let's say, the, the desired state, which uh, backend had been targeted for this uh, bucket. And I have another command, which is able to check the... Sorry, it's a very small screen. But it is uh, fetching the status of this bucket. Exactly, the status represents the last known state of uh, this bucket. So back to the labels, you can see it's uh, auto-posed, and it's up here on all three uh, backends. So what? Ah, the other nice command is we can monitor the bucket on the actual backends. This is the, the local stack B backend, and you can see the bucket is, uh, exists, is available. And I do the same command for the local stack C uh, backend. And you see the bucket is exists there. So the next step I would like to show you is, and don't do this at uh, production, I would uh, destroy one of the, the providers, the local stack C providers, and set the replicas to zero. So I destroy. The, the backend, and this, if, if you see in this box that there is no response from this backend. And um, it's time to speak about this auto pause feature that once the back bucket is available, all of the backends or reach the minimum replicas, uh, which we said, uh, the, the provider uh, pauses the reconciliation of this bucket because we can't keep in the memory every bucket we would like to reconcile. So in this case, we just sleep the reconciliation of this bucket. So any kind of heel check events, we can wake up the bucket and uh, do what we would like again. So if I disable this uh, auto-pausing feature on this uh, bucket, that you can see it's nothing happened because uh, the backend is not available and providers have marked the backend as failed. And, but on the status field, you can see that only A and B are, uh, that so the bucket is available on the A and the B backends, so C is missing. So once I set the replicas to one and the backend came online again, after a few seconds, we can see that the backend is online again, but it does not contain the bucket. We have an error here. Thank you. And hopefully, after a while, it will fix. Needs a few seconds. What is happening? Sorry. Ah, it's up here. We have the bucket on, on the, the missing uh, backend. Uh, this should happen. So in this case, I disabled and enabled the auto uh, pause 
by manually, but this should happen uh, automatically. I don't need to change uh, the bucket itself because the here check reconciler uh, wakes up every bucket uh, which is affected in this uh, scenario. So hopefully the bucket will be available again after I upscaled uh, the cluster and the bucket is on this backend, right? So the next scenario is very interesting that I downscale the local stack C uh, backend again, but this time I disable synchronizing of uh, this bucket by the label. So I set the local stack C label to false directly. And you can see it has changed here. That means that this bucket has to be available on these two backends, but it's not mandatory on the third one. So if I start the backend again, it won't create it won't create the bucket on this backend because I temporarily disabled it. We can wait a few seconds, but you can believe in me. So anytime I can email, enable the synchronization on this backend by setting the label to true. As you see, it, I set the label to true, and it's appear in the backend again. And that is the demo I wanted to show you. And uh, it's time to talk about uh, yeah, performance, but before the performance, that's a, a small summary of everything that we absolutely love Kubernetes and also Crossplane, which is very too easy to develop, but a bit harder to scale. And uh, where we are in the, in the journey that we had feature freeze the first version of the, the provider, uh, you have to know that the objects are not uh, scoped for the first uh, release, and we are open for any kind of contribution. So if you would like to join to an innovative open source project or working on cutting edge technology, just feel free to uh, reach us on, on uh, GitHub. So the next topic is uh, performance and scalability. Before I jump into, please raise your hands if you believe you have more than 5,000 records in your uh, ETCD cluster under your FEC, under Kubernetes. Uh, a few. Ten thousands. <laughs> Things start to be tricky uh, at that scale. So the first slide is for the ones who are rushing to the plane. <laughs> it's just a summary. I would like to talk about two dimensions of, uh, of scaling. One dimension is the vertical, where we increase the number of the custom resource definitions. So we have lots of kind of objects in the, in the API server. The other uh, Dimension is the horizontal scaling when we scale the number of the custom resources themselves. So we have lots of resources from, from one type. So when we increase the number of the custom resource definitions, that the API discovery should be a big issue, exactly. It should be a system killer issue. If you have some misconfigured uh, clients, they can destroy the API server at all. And also because of the API discovery and other kind of uh, backend jobs that uh, you can experience very poor API server responsiveness. And you have, you have to count with very high peaks of CPU and memory loads when API server starts to do some background jobs <laughs> on, on that many uh, objects kind. Um, from the other side of the story, the horizontal uh, thing, that unfiltered list operations should be an issue. They can kill the API server if you start a few of them uh, to fetch every custom resource definition. Storage is uh, the most critical part of, of everything. And also, you have to count with the uh, high memory and the uh, uh, network utilization, because lots of data moving around and uh, some data moving redundantly and multiple times, so it's a bit tricky to predict. So just a few words about the, the vertical scaling, because it's not as, uh, an issue for us, uh, because we have only one resource. 
The problems tend to start around 500 custom resource definitions, which sounds uh, pretty much, but keep in mind that some cross plane providers has more than 800 custom resource definitions. So exactly one provider is able to, to destroy your uh, cluster performance. But luckily the cross plane uh, have a new feature for partially deploy custom resource definitions, so it is already solved. You have to keep in mind that some clients are not designed to work with more than 50 or 100 uh, custom resource definition. The, the cube cutter command is one of uh, them. Uh, my next advice is uh, not relevant anymore, I think, but always use uh, Kubernetes 1.26 uh, uh, plus because the cross-plane uh, folks did uh, awesome work to optimize uh, Kubernetes and lots of components uh, around the custom resource definitions and the API discovery. So the next topic is the horizontal scaling of uh, the, the story. And the first layer I would like to mention is the storage side, which is exactly not part of this uh, presentation. It's, uh, it's a very deep uh, topic alone. But ETCD performance is, is very critical, but ETCD performance depends on the underlying, underlying storage. So exactly the storage speed is uh, very, uh, very critical for random access. So this is an important uh, thing. So what you can do is hire experts who know what they do. And based on your storage type, it's pretty easy to achieve the, the case in the, in the picture. You can see that the ETCD is uh, sleeping. All threads are waiting for IO. And once ETCD is uh, dead, the next component would be the API manager. After a while, it would dead. And when API manager is down, the Kubernetes controller manager goes down. <laughs> so the entire cluster just uh, falls, falls down. The other side I would like to mention is uh, the controller side, actually the provider itself, the operator, what we, what we develop. The main bottleneck here is, is the memory. And the reason of this, that each uh, controller instance uh, has a cache, a local cache, which holds all of the uh, resources it is reconciling, and all the last known state is in the memory in every instance. I don't suggest to turn this, <laughs> this off, because otherwise you should have other troubles. But you have to find the best uh, cache uh, synchronization period uh, of your system. And also, you have to filter the watch uh, Filter resources by label uh, because you can't uh, watch every bucket when you have 100,000 of, of them. You have to count with longer startups because if you have that, that much uh, of uh, resources, it took uh, minutes for the controller to fill up the cache. And um, also, you have to configure the timeout because uh, it is very easy to find yourself in a situation when every client is always times out because you have too much, too much uh, resources. Uh, always take care on your rate limits and burst and timeouts and actively monitor them because misconfigured clients otherwise can uh, kill your API server performance. And uh, in our experiences, it is much cheaper to retry the failed actions in a controller then dropping everything and recuing the object and building everything again. So if you have any failure, on, on uh, better to retry it uh, once, once you have everything in the memory and everything in, in place. And uh, <laughs> the, one of the trickiest part of this is uh, you have to forget leader elected operate, operators. Uh, it should be a bit tricky. And always ensure your best reconciliation concurrency, how many items you reconcile at the, the same time. And sleep and wake up resource recon reconciliation, as I mentioned, the auto pause feature does this. We can uh, put uh, some buckets to sleep. I would like to talk about uh, from the Kubernetes API server side of uh, the performance. So my first advice is use the latest kernel because engineers of Google changed the, the kernel stack and they have found a big performance improvement on the TCP stack. 
uh, design your network to be able to handle as many active connections as possible because there are watchers everywhere. Um, from the CPU and memory side, that infinite is the best, of course. On the server side, you also have to configure rage limits and burst and timeouts uh, because this is the first line protection of your API server. The pain point is that custom resource slices are misses, so we can paginate the custom resources when we fetch uh, it from the Kubernetes API server. And uh, you can only scale Kubernetes API server vertically because it's a leader elected, uh, uh, it has a leader election architecture, so there is only one leader at a time. And uh, best if you can configure a proxy service in front of your API server to, to uh, avoid unnecessary load and repetitive load on the, on the server. And you can delegate load via, uh, with the aggregation API. And it also should have to decrease the load on the API server. <laughs> Related to regarding to the configuration options uh, we have, there are only just a few configuration options like batch cache disabled and uh, event time to leave and uh, mutating maximum request in flight are the most important. So there are not too, too much configuration to set up. So I think everything is prepared. We know everything. So it's time to start the cluster. So coders, start your engines. It was a short drive. <laughs> um, Kubernetes API server, after maybe 20 thousands of buckets, we experienced the object uh, out of memory errors in the Kubernetes API server. And after, uh, after the kernel tried to restart the API server, we experienced that uh, we have a higher baseline compared to the, init compared to the initial baseline, but the, the tendency is the same, that it will fill the memory, all of the memory available. And after a few restarts, that the kernel just terminates the process and we don't have API server anymore, so we lose the cluster itself. After, a few hours of investigation, I have found that the watch cache is the, the one who is trying to keep everything in the memory. So I just uh, disabled the watch cache. And I hopefully you, you can see that the memory consumption went to normal and we don't have any memory issues uh, with this cache. But the, the question is, what is cache good for? And the main reason of this cache is to speed up list kind of operation. When we fetch uh, lots of data from the Kubernetes API server. But unfortunately, this isn't the case because uh, when you have 50,000 buckets, building the cache is almost the same time as fetching the data and sending over the network. So maybe the you can see the numbers, but it was 53 seconds without the cache, and it was 1 minute and 41 seconds with the cache. So it seems cache is for speeding up things, but not it at this scale. So that's just a summary. Benefits are not included. Kubernetes API server is a single point of failure. So you have to, so you have to deal with those limitations and uh, in our case, this system is an internal system, so we can deal with them. But these limitations are driving the design choices you made in the, in the, the system. So the API server does not scale well, and it is pretty easy to kill with unfiltered at least uh, operations. So you have to take care on, on this part. Uh, the server and client-side bursts are first-line protection of your server. And uh, the leader, leaderless operation, operators are tricky and not so common. You just can't find too many information about them. And the object reconciliation pause logic is, uh, is mandatory. And you have to count with some clients may not tolerate huge data sets or, or large uh, timeouts. 
But uh, the question what we did is, can we go further? Can we do 100,000 buckets per second? And uh, the answer is uh, uh, yes, we should. But our future plan with this uh, project is uh, seamless integration with distributed control planes like uh, KCP or Karmada, where we can distribute all the load across multiple regions and data centers, what we want. So what we would like to achieve is a single entry point, infinite buckets, and everything is top on for load meeting. Thank you so much, and I think it's time for question to Connor.